Just the name makes you laugh. <laughs> Go for it, Jen. <laughs> Thanks, Lucy. It's very dangerous being introduced by someone who knows you all too well. Um, uh, and of course, it's an absolute pleasure uh, to be here. And the stayers amongst you all, there's a lot of stayers, more stayers in the last session than I've seen at most conferences I've ever been at. It's been a wonderful day to listen uh, to everybody, and I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Appreciate the invite. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm just broadly going to talk a little bit about the higher ed uh, pan, uh, standards panel, but also just as a vice chancellor, some of the things, you know, observations that I would make um, across uh, the quality assurance area. And uh, I guess one of the uh, things that we, uh, that I, I'm reminded of, is um, a particular politician in the U.S. in the 1950s said the only thing that saves us from bureaucracy is inefficiency. Well, I, I actually think that um, what's been evident today in the speakers is that the situation's well and truly changed. In the last half century, uh, what we're seeing now is quite an efficient bureaucracy. But times have also changed in that the way we are thinking about that beast, that um, efficient bureaucracy, has also changed. And I don't believe that any of the vice chancellors think that it's something that we need saving from if it's working very well. We are now very much uh, matured to the point where we acknowledge the need for public accountability. We know that we're spending taxpayers' money, and there's not one VC that I know who would ever uh, question the fact that taxpayers need to know how their money is being spent. And I think over 50 years that's changed quite considerably. We also know that we need to work cost effectively and that we need to work within a framework based on goals and priorities um, that are clear and agreed. I think that's accepted across the sector and I don't think um, there's uh, any person in a VC's role who would question the need for a regulator. How the regulator works, of course, is another issue and um, there's been some commentary on that uh, right through the whole day. But I guess my major message for um, my presentation is that um, the responsible players in the sector not only need but actually want that um, effective regulator because we can see the benefits that it creates. Um, and it's also, I think, important to acknowledge the role of both coalition and Labor governments uh, over the last several decades as being major change agents within Australia, within Australian higher ed. Um, Ours is essentially a pretty conservative sector and uh, the constructive tension that is created by a partnership between universities and that bureaucracy has clearly been necessary to encourage and support reforms. Um, and th those reforms have been in particularly important areas like learning and teaching, like social justice and equity, and the, de the development of mutually beneficial partnerships between universities and industry. And I think without that constructive tension, a lot of those things may have um, not been as well developed as I think we all can say they are now. It is appropriate, though, that the nature of the relationship between universities and the bureaucracy be regularly reviewed and rethought and potentially recalibrated, I think that might be the word of the day, in order to ensure that we all have the settings correct. And that is that we have the right balance, that we have um, the nature of the changing operating environment absolutely factored in, and we all know that that changed environment is um, changing more and more rapidly all the time, so the regulation in, has to also accommodate that. And that the effort justifies the outcomes. Um, and finally, that the benefits uh, to the broad range of stakeholders are um, taken into consideration and optimised. I think it's also necessary to make sure that all parties are working in effective partnership, um, uh, walk, working together, walking together to improve the sector, to achieve the same goals um, and to make sure that that's a, as efficient and as effective as um, possible. It's really not in anyone's best interest to operate in a house divided um, on this. So I think making sure that that partnership is very clear, that ongoing dialogue that's been commented on several times today, uh, making sure that it is a true partnership, not just periods of consultation, is absolutely critical. So I've kind of approached this as uh, representing a communique to the Higher Ed Standards Panel, but with some other comments as well thrown in. And um, in essence, I thought it might be um, useful to inject some comments coming from a vice chancellor who's also been very active in the um, in the quality assurance space prior to being a vice chancellor. So, uh, as um, you will have read, I've done quite a lot of audits for both Alqua and also for other um, international jurisdictions. So, actually, I would be one of the people that would be considered to be kind of a true believer around quality and standards, um, and have played in this space a lot. So, it's really very interesting to then step into a Vice-Chancellor's role and um, see that through a Vice-Chancellor's lens uh, for me. So um, 
We know the higher ed standards panel is, um, is the foundation that the regulatory framework is built on. And the panel members must therefore have a very deep understanding of what um, standards can achieve and what uh, factors influence their achievement. And I have to say, uh, with Alan Robson and, um, and uh, Richard, um, I have a lot of faith in that. We're dealing with some very uh, profoundly experienced and smart people driving the standards panel. So that gives me a level of comfort. What well, doesn't necessarily give me a level of comfort is that psychology of regulation that we were talking about earlier in the year and how that then might be overlaid when we look at the regulatory framework over the top of the standards. The panel also needs to have um, a, a well-formed view on how they should be used, therefore. In other words, I'm hoping that the panel is able to influence that psychology of re regulation once they've established those um, standards, how then they are to be used. Um, so um, what do I want from that regulator? Well, I guess my request from the regulator is twofold. Um, and I guess it reflects the dual nature of the title of this day. And I think it's a very good title, The Quirks of Compliance and Quest for Quality. I think they are the kind of yin and yang of everything that we deal with in this room. And my request actually reflects both of those. Firstly, I, I request that, they, that, they, that the regulator, um, no, I require I don't request it. I really require assurance to a set of minimum standards that protects students and Brand Australia. Um, I think Brand Australia is something that we all should be proud of and it's very easily lost and therefore th there is that assurance that's provided by some minimum standards. But secondly, against what appears to be in the current trend, I really desire that this entity is able to add value to the sector through informed contributions towards quality improvement. The whole language of quality improvement seems to have completely gone. I'm not entirely sure where, but it doesn't seem to be around, and even today, right through the entire day, I, I, there was maybe one or two mentions of quality improvement, but uh, it seems to have gone, and that worries me. So just thinking about the first uh, point, um, there's no doubt there's been a massive amount of work being done so far and more to be done on the, um, on the standards. The threshold standards are, are well established. Um, and the review that um, Richard was talking about uh, is clearly uh, deeply immersed in um, a whole bunch of work and it's shaping up to, to look quite good from my perspective. And no need for me to go over that because you're all here as well. But um, I think it's suffice to say that when you read through the various threshold standards and now some of the other standards, what strikes um, most, uh, what strikes me and I suspect strikes most experienced academics is that it's very familiar territory. Few would be surprised at the expectations described in these standards. Um, and I guess that's not at all surprising given that the threshold standards have been developed to reflect world's best practice and Australian universities have not only sought to build that into their own practices um, but have actively contributed to their development and I would argue have led uh, in terms of world's best practice in universities uh, globally. So I think it's worth reminding regulators uh, of this simple fact that they're not actually monitoring our compliance against their standards, they're actually measuring our compliance against our standards. Um, and I think that's something that comes from uh, deep within the sector. And, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but actually we're um, uh, measuring compliance against our standards. Um, so why universities uh, may not have been very active in communicating that sort of detail to, us, to its external stakeholders in the past, um, I think the threshold standards at the very least sit very well with universities. And I understand there's a significant diversity in the sector, but I'm speaking particularly as a university stakeholder. And I think that, um, that they sit very comfortably with universities. If anything, the major point of tension is between the notion of minimum standards as defined in the thresholds and the striving for high academic standards. Uh, that's the norm in universities and the essence of what we most value. And that's not at all a trivial concern for me because uh, I uh, sometimes consider what was lost um, in the 1990s in the vocational education and training sector when it embraced standards to such a degree that it abandoned graded assessment for students altogether. Such a consideration is of course an anathema for higher education, but it's just a function of where you actually get to, what is the end point in the journey on standards, and I would hope that it is not towards that across the sector. Returning to the um, point about academic staff being naturally very comfortable working with minimum standards, I think we all know 
uh, that the normal course, course accreditation process is a fundamental consideration um, for threshold performance that is required to gain any particular qualifications. We're in the business of um, assessing standards and graduating students to a certain standard and indeed stretching out to a very high performance standard as we go about assessing students and indeed accrediting courses and the like. And there are examples of this worldwide. So um, there are additional levels of performance that have been included in the UK QAA standards for their honours degrees, where they've added two additional levels to the consideration of threshold performance. Um, their typical performance, which is basically um, performance that yields um, the lower upper second class boundary and excellent performance equating to that required for first class honours. So for me, that all leads to a conclusion that complying with threshold standards comes naturally to universities. Uh, it's a good checklist to make sure nothing's dropped off the radar and as pressures are placed on universities to remind ourselves what our fundamental purpose is. But at the end of the day, this is the stuff that academics and universities actually, uh, basically, I believe it's in our DNA. Um, but um, there are aspects of uh, the current um, uh, mindset that do continue to elude me, though. And I have to say this is coming from, you know, some of the, the government um, and, and regulator thinking, but I'm thinking at this stage of things like the AQF, Australian Qualifications Framework. Is there really a need, for example, to insist that the AQF uh, has to have exactly 10 levels, like we're somehow um, a metric system or something? Um, uh, uh, if we had moved to 11 or maybe 12, if you look at level eight and all the argy-bargy about level eight, would it really have mattered? Um, really? Um, 10's neat, very neat. But, you know, I think a framework actually needs to fit practice rather than trying to squeeze practice into a framework. And so I think some of that stuff has started to drive behaviours that, for me, just feel a little bit clunky in the system. So I don't think the earth would have spun off its axis, for example, if we had 11 or even 12 um, levels in the AQF. Um, but broadly, I think the reform has been very much in the right direction. And the review um, that's been discussed this afternoon, the review of higher ed uh, regulation, um, uh, found that the move from eight separate systems to a single national regulator has been uni universally applauded as meeting an unambiguous need. And I would agree with that. Um, and then when I also think about that, um, that this body should have teeth is also without question. There's no room in the higher ed sector for dodgy practices, absolutely none whatsoever, or dodgy providers. Uh, and it does the whole sector a whole lot of um, damage when those dodgy providers um, are able to um, practice. Uh, we all know circumstances and we know that we're starting to um, come back um, on those. But uh, it hasn't helped brand Australia, and I think uh, it's something we all need to be um, very vigilant around. Uh, having a regulator with teeth is something that we need to make sure that our entire sector's reputation is protected. We know, and it was mentioned earlier, um, around the international reputation that a small number, a very small number of providers that were unscrupulous uh, did to the sector, and how vulnerable we were all for that damage that was created by those weak links. So I have absolutely zero concern with a regulator that has teeth, and that's particularly focused on I'm sure there are far more um, scholarly or accurate words, but I'm going to use it, dodgy providers and dodgy standards. I also want to see a strong regulator that can quickly identify um, and address those bad behaviours. The word is quickly, um, so that they can be um, modified and or closed down so that they can protect us in a very swift way before significant damage is caused. But there's also a difference between a regulator with teeth, um, as I have just been alluding to, and regulatory overreach, um, which might occur if we weren't really very careful about how we manage our regulation. That might take us in the wrong direction. Um, and it, it is um, always potentially there that the establishment of powerful bureaucracies uh, may tend towards regulatory overreach and, particular, and the development of unwieldy structures. And we need to be really mindful of that. I think some of the key to this is some of the words that Greg was using earlier today around um, the psychology of um, regulation. I think that's a really neat way of saying it. Um, we also must appreciate that the notion of TEXA as the sole regulator is essentially misleading because there are any num 
number of agencies that also um, serve as partners in regulation with universities. And we saw a list of some of those regulators um, just before afternoon tea as well. And they, they place a lot of demands on institutions as well. So the sole regulator is true in terms of the states moving to um, one central one, but actually there's a lot of other regulation that comes in, um, not least of which professional accrediting bodies and the like. Hence, we've really got a point uh, where issues such as duplication and regulation, uh, regulatory overreach, um, need to be uh, thought about and tweaked or modified. I'm not one for throwing the baby out with the bathwater, and I do believe that there may need to be some recalibration of the system, but actually the fundamentals are basically there. Indeed, I would have argued, and, I, and you may have gathered um, so far that I'm a bit of a fan of the old way of the ALQA um, process, but indeed if the regulator with teeth was added to an ALQA model, that actually might have got us to where the sector needed to get to without throwing that out and bringing something new in, but that's another story. Uh, so for me, I think the report um, on the review of the higher ed regulation has done an absolutely exemplary job and in my mind has, is striking the right balance. Um, and it's remarkable just how straightforward a lot of those recommendations actually are. They're kind of straightforward and obvious, but that shouldn't be seen to undermine the excellent work. Indeed, quite to the contrary, I would say that um, it, the straightforward and sensible recommendations in an official report is deserving of the highest possible praise and congratulations. Uh, but it does display to us that this is not rocket science for the sector. The sector really does understand what we need. and. Um, uh, that we kind of know where we're going, and I think the review demonstrated that. Of course, there's also a need to focus on proportionality and the impact of meaningful differences between different types of um, providers. For universities, the thousand year history that precedes us and the tradition of self-accrediting institutions is not at all irrelevant for us. The values and motivations of well-established self-accrediting institutions are very different from some of the other uh, for-profit, newly established self-accrediting higher ed providers that we compete with. And I think the rigours of academic professionalism, the thing that makes ac an academic an academic, is something that we shouldn't overlook. And that includes um, some of the things that m are the fundamental cornerstones of the academy, things like peer review, things like academic val uh, validation. Um, academic val validation as a driver for academics is far stronger than things like financial reward. Those sorts of things, that sense of professionalism amongst the collegiate is something that has been built up over thousands of years and something that we shouldn't underestimate in terms of setting quality and standards agendas. The role of long established academic boards and collegiate decision making, these are things that actually um, help to protect our sector and have been established over very many years. They're just, um, just a few, but there are others such as the corporatisation of university senates and councils. The reform in recent uh, decades uh, around risk management, accountability and fiduciary duty um, so that they become business as usual for managers like me. And the demands of the marketplace, making sure that um, uh, we um, effectively have to elevate um, excellence in all operations to make sure that we have a long-term future in the sector as an institution, both providing a product a program of study or research product or something like that that actually uh, has good reputation, rep, uh, a good reputation, but also is run as efficiently as possible because of our fiduciary role. Put simply, universities, in my view, have form. Um, Spring Carnival in Melbourne, it's hard to go past using that language, but I do think we've got form. Um, there's a, and there's a, uh, so there's basically a wide range of powerful factors that make universities far safer candidates for self-regulation than many organisations in the corporate world, and they get far less regulation than what we do. But that doesn't remove the need for regulation. No one wants to see taxpayers' funds uh, put at risk. And as I said earlier, I'm a, I'm a true believer in the quality and standards argument. But it does suggest that the principles of risk, necessity and proportionality should have greater practical influence on regulatory approaches sooner rather than later. Earned, earned autonomy, purely and simply, strengthens the system. In practice, a regulator that ensures that the fundamentals are in place and working well for self-accrediting institutions can then focus more effort on NSAIs and new entrants. And this comes back to some of the stuff that Greg was talking about, is making sure that we look at how a university is governed and managed. And if that is okay, and all those are in place, then we can assume that underneath that is going well as well. I would support that. Um, that puts uh, the emphasis where it needs to be and also represents value for money for the Australian taxpayer. 
Another outcome of the review is that, um, so self-evident to be obvious, or vice versa, I guess, is that the need to re reduce red tape and the significant expense of institutions demonstrating compliance. No argument from anyone, I'm, I'm sure. But I think one of the things that's really um, important is to continue to remember just how accountable we are to so many bodies um, and to ensure that the information, and I know this is one of the directions that we're heading, is being collected uh, that's sufficient but not excessive and that it's used as much as possible for multiple purposes. As, and they need to be key principles whenever we're gathering data. And that means that regulators need to talk to each other uh, and maybe it's happening, but it's not immediately apparent from my position. In that context, I'd be remiss if I didn't express my disappointment um, uh, with um, the, last, the last round of mission-based compacts. Um, discussions with the department always represent useful opportunities for universities, but frankly, uh, it was very hard pressed to make anything of this year's compacts discussion. It was a vacuous process, not linked to anything that had any funding associated with it and took up significant institutional resources. One really has to question the role of those sorts of things and also things like institutional p performance portfolios when there isn't a clear rationale for what, what they're intended to achieve um, and uh, how they're going to be used. And that didn't help perceptions in terms of red tape and uh, uh, parts of the sector not talking to each other. So as for performance portfolios, I observe that the department grossly overestimates the value of those for universities themselves. Personally, I'd rather use my scarce resources in the statistics area of my university to generate management information of my own choosing that will help us drive our strategy and therefore be more um, valuable to the university business. At this stage, it's impossible to tell where that data actually kind of ends up and the compacts is another layer of, I'm not sure why we do that. If someone can help explain to me why we need to do compacts, that'll be great. The second requirement um, I specified for a regulator was a value add to the sector through informed contributions that would I would be calling quality improvement. This is an area that might put me in conflict with other colleagues, but actually I think that the loss of the former Alqua, um, the Australian University's quality agency, and the um, uh, transmography transition, whatever transmogrification into Texa. Um, uh, and they're uh, looking at themed um, reports, which has now um, been removed, has left a real gap in the sector. It may or may not come um, to, as a shock to the audience um, that I hear from academic staff when they look at the threshold standards, they say kind of like big deal, that's what we do anyway, what's that all about? But I think um, academics are used to being pushed to excellence. And underpinning that, of course, is a minimum standards. But for me, and particularly at universities that are self-accrediting, it's like having a specification on an S-class Mercedes-Benz that says it should have an engine and four wheels. It's kind of like a der moment. Um, uh, so um, I basically, the, I uh, would argue that the reforms associated with the higher ed standards framework add a significant improvement to the old protocols. But what worries me is that old audit and advisory function that Alqua used to have seems to have been lost altogether from the sector. And I think that's quite a significant loss. The fact that we haven't really even talked about that today indicates to me that that loss has been fairly swift. Uh, and it, might be, it should be remembered that the period in which Alqua uh, operated coincided with an accelerated period of the maturing of the higher ed uh, sector in Australia, particularly in regard to university teaching and the degree of professionalism in university management. And I don't see that at all as being coincidental. So um, I firmly believe that without the actions of the Commonwealth through that period and Alqua as major change agents, those developments would not have occurred as efficiently or as effectively as, um, as they have. So I know that TEXA and the review are now putting things like uh, quality assurance and quality improvement um, through um, to the Office of Learning and Teaching. That that uh, concerns me as well. It, it may be that the sector has matured sufficiently for this to occur, but I refer earlier to that constructive tension that's been provided by interaction between universities and critical external agencies. Uh, that in the right doses actually works to the benefit of universities, uh, which are often reluctant to change. So if leadership for change and reform does not come from the sector itself, then where, where will it come from? Who will drive it? 
will it come from a government department, a much diminished OLT that's really focusing on learning and teaching, in which case where is the quality improvement for other aspects of the university business going to come from? Is it going to come from HERDSA? Is it going to come from ATEM? Is it going to come from Universities Australia? I'm just not sure. So I can actually well imagine a scenario where by the end of the decade discussions concerning the value of serious external quality assurance functions for the regulator turn up again and we're back into looking at exactly how we're going to work together to improve the sector. Other areas of leadership that Alqua showed quite clearly was around partnering with universities and testing against what the university specifically wanted to, um, to work on. And that championed diversity in the sector. Right now, many of the drivers for us as Vice-Chancellors are leading to a far more um, unified kind of um, approach to universities. Despite the rhetoric that we are an increasingly diversified sector, the pressure uh, to conform um, using um, uh, uh, quantitative based KPIs, rankings and so on, really identifies the single correct model for university that we're all expected to aspire to. And I can tell you many people suggest that a university like USQ is a university that aspires to be a GO8, you know, kind of like in your dreams, mate. And I'm saying, um, actually, no, we don't aspire to be a GO8, we're actually aspiring to be something quite different we're, and we're very proud of what we're achieving. So what's missing here is that sense of balance and nuance and alternate perspectives, judgment, human judgment, experienced high, um, higher education sector judgment. And if the pressures to conform prevail, diversity within the sector will diminish and I think that's a bit tragic. So having a regulator that has specific expertise that partners with universities provides the basis for that specialist expertise and it should be available to university managers like myself. I would like to see us get full value from our regulator, including um, utilising that expertise that is shared then for the benefit and development of the sector as a whole. So broadly then to sum up, I would say firstly, Threshold standards are pretty familiar territory for uh, universities and for academics. And I think complying with them comes naturally to universities. They do act as a good checklist for us. But as I said, I see these as our standards that we're being tested against rather than other person's standards. I think regulation works best when it involves partnership and uh, where it's appreciated that the regulators uh, are here to serve all stakeholders, in uh, of course including the institutions themselves. And that partnership needs to be ongoing with dialogue and conversation at all times, not just during consultation periods. As thirdly, there needs to be a balance between effort and evidence um, to make sure that we're meeting our public obligations, I have no question about that, but to also make sure that our resources are used effectively. And finally, I think we need to remain vigilant about the possibility that we may have lost some aspects of regulation and audit that we can't yet afford to do without. Um, it may be that we mature to a point where we can, but at my, at my point um, of, of the maturation of the university sector, I actually see it as a gap that we have stopped talking about. So the challenge for any regulatory system is how well it's able to anticipate and accommodate future change. And I'm going to look forward to seeing how resilient and effective our emerging framework is um, in what is essentially an incredibly volatile and dynamic operating environment. But I'll leave it there, Luce. Thanks. You do pack in a lot. <laughs> that was a very power-packed um, discussion and uh, presentation, Jan. Thank you very much. Um, has anyone got any questions for Jan? Don't go away. <laughs> Okay, that'd be lovely. Here, be close to me. Um, is that Tony? It is Tony. Uh, Tony Hayward from Campion College. Um, there's a point that came up a couple of times in your presentation that concerns me, and that was talking about dodgy private providers. Um, I also noticed uh, probably about two months ago there was a, an article by uh, Greg Craven and Glyn Davis in The Australian, which I think made a, a comment along the lines of a um, very similar thing. Universities shouldn't have as much closed regulation, Texas needs to focus on, uh, and I think they referred to a series of failures of dodgy private providers. Um, now, something which Ian Hawke can uh, probably confirm for us, um, there hasn't actually ever been a failure of a private higher education provider in Australia. Um, yet this theme keeps coming up that there are dodgy private higher education providers that fail. Um, there have been vet providers who have failed, but there haven't been any higher education providers. Now, I 
totally support your uh, claim about a lighter touch for institutions that have been able to demonstrate um, that they've been able to meet standards. Um, the new uh, proposals from Texa are talking about a closer look at people who've been operating the last five years, um, and I think that applies to private providers who have proven that they've been able to operate and aren't dodgy, and uh, yeah, there, there aren't a lot out there that would fit into that category. Uh, thanks. Uh, look, uh, absolutely, the vast bulk of private providers are outstanding, but I think it's also fair to say there have been incidents over the last few years where some have not been, and unfortunately it's very disproportionate in terms of the damage to the reputation that they can provide, um, you know, by not being as good as what we might like um, or what we might expect of a provider. Um, I, I've had first-hand experience with um, at least one, and I, I, and I know they exist, but I think it's, it's, you're right, I think it's very isolated, but unfortunately the damage caused by that can actually be quite widespread. So the vast bulk of provi private providers w will be excellent, arguably, in their, the areas that they're teaching in, they'll be better than the, 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 the public universities, no question about that. But there are some, and I think there has been history here, at, um, where there have been some, and unfortunately they haven't done the reputation of the sector any good at all. Um, now, I think there's also some examples where universities haven't behaved nicely either, um, and um, so I, I think that's, that's a fair cop. I think that's a fair cop. Thanks, Jan. Um, we actually, I think we are running actually close to time anyway, so I think I might, um, thank you very much. Thanks to Jan. I don't want to cut another very important person's time. Oh, did you have a question for Jan? Don't go away. Jan, it's Andrew Trounson at the Australian. <laughs> <laughs> uh, with, the, with the quality assurance issue and how quickly it's been dumped by the sector, I, look, I'd noticed that as well. Um, why do you think the sector dumped it, has stopped talking about it so quickly? Why does the sector seem so almost happy about no longer wanting to talk about quality assurance like this? Uh, uh, Andrew, I'm not really sure why we've stopped talking about it. But, um, I, I guess in part it might be because it was a little um, softer than uh, the, the kind of hard-edged notion of, you know, getting the tick of approval to, to operate, um, being, you know, reaching certain standards and so on. So it, it kind of, I think, just slipped away because the urgency around creating a new regulator and the concern that people might have around language like s standards and compliance and accreditation and so on just became the dominant um, conversation. And somewhere along the line we've just kind of forgotten about it. I think the um, last two years of TEXA, and the TEXA guys will confirm it, they've tried um, to some degree to maintain that with some of their themed reports, I can't remember if that's the right language, but that's now gone as well. Um, and I just think that the sector has not really got an avenue at this stage for debating and discussing how the sector can improve. Particularly, things have gone quite, you know, kind of private. Um, sure, universities can talk um, within themselves and some of the consortiums are working on things and so on, but where is the public debate about driving quality improvement across the sector? I'm not sure I'm seeing it anymore. Thanks, Jan. Um, I, I won't take any more questions because we do have another very, very, very important gentleman who uh, to come and speak with us. <laughs>